Good evening. Welcome to the Bath Studio School. And tonight we are joined by Joe Raymond, Labour Councillor for Bath. Uh, so, Mr Raymond, could you tell us a bit about yourself? Uh, so, I'm a Labour Councillor in Twerton, uh, which is one of the most deprived areas uh, of Bath. Uh, I've been a councillor there for the last three years or so. Um, stood for, for Labour in the general election in Bath last year. Um, and I work for a local charity. Okay, very nice. For the audience who don't know, don't know you so well, could you tell us a bit about what a Labour councillor does in their everyday today? So, um, my, my main things are, are representing uh, the people in, in Twerton, uh, dealing with casework issues, uh, helping them out when they, when they need a hand, uh, and trying to make positive change uh, across the whole of Bath and obviously Somerset with, with Labour values. So, doing things like uh, recently we've uh, got better support for the children of alcoholics uh, in Baines. Uh, we've got care leavers exempted from council tax up to the age of 25. Uh, we've stopped any badger culling on, on council land. Um, so that, just a few of the things that we've done recently. Uh, and probably one of the best things that, uh, that we've done uh, since I was elected was uh, we put forward a motion about uh, resetting Syrian refugees uh, in Baines. And, and now we've got a number of families uh, Syrian refugees living in Bath. Okay, and when you're not working, what do you like to get up to yourself in your free time? <coughs> um, oh, well, I uh, obviously I work full time. Yeah. In addition to being a counsellor, uh, so my free time is is limited uh, between uh, my job, doing council stuff, stuff with the party. Um, I'm a uh, I'm a fan of craft beer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, watching. Watching Netflix. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. very nice. Uh, how do you think your background has influenced your political stance? Um, so uh, I come from a, a single mother uh, family, um, fairly low income, uh, constantly chased by debt um, uh, while I was growing up um, uh, in a fairly you know, deprived area of, of North Kent. Uh, and I went to university and... and got more politicised at university. I, I was at university when uh, when the coalition government came in and, yeah. and brought about £9,000 tuition fees. So I wasn't hit by that, but I was part of the uh, one, a student at the time yeah. and saw that, that we were being attacked by, by the uh, Tory Liberal government. Um, and then you know, it made me more, more left-wing uh, and I kind of yeah. you know, I came to the Labour Party through uh, idea, ideas and ideals that, you know, I wouldn't have at the time potentially you know, labelled a socialist. It was just what I thought was right, you know, right and fair. Um, and that led me to the Labour Party. Okay. Um, now we're going to get into some more political questions here. So in <coughs> last year's election, the Labour Party stated that they'd like to increase the minimum wage. Now, many people would argue that the fact that we'd see a downfall in, very, in small businesses. How would you respond to that? Well, uh, I would say that no one should be paid less than they can afford to live on. Uh, as, a, as a fundamental principle, if you're going to work, you should have enough to live. Uh, that's, uh, yeah, and, and, yeah. and in fact, I'd say no one should ever not have enough to live on. I don't yeah, want to see anyone in, in abject poverty. Um, but, but these are the arguments that we used uh, 20 years ago now, in 1998, when, when the then Labour government brought in the minimum wage. Uh, and William Haig and the Tories at the time argued against it and said it would cause unemployment and, and, and all of these arguments that come around any time you talk about raising the minimum mm -hmm. wage. Uh, and it just didn't turn out to be true. These are arguments made by people who have a vested interest in keeping the minimum wage low. These are people who want uh, to pay their staff less so that they can profit more. Uh, and then those staff will get tax credits uh, and other um, social securities to top up their income despite the fact that they're working. You know, when, when things like tax credits you know, are, are great uh, and stop people from, from falling into massive poverty, but at the end of the day, for, for a lot of people, that, that is the state and, and the taxpayer, uh, the general public, topping up the wages because their employers are not paying them enough. And actually, you know, the employers should be paying them enough. Yeah. Uh, we shouldn't be you know, subsidising bad bosses. Yeah. So you don't think that increasing the minimum wage would have any negative impact on small businesses or uh, the livelihood of the others, like uh, say, like the, the family supporting the owners of small businesses and stuff like that? Uh, no, I, I don't think so. Uh, you know, 
a lot of small businesses won't be paying their their mm-hmm. staff. Uh, a lot of small businesses are very ethical, and, that, and they won't be yeah. paying their staff less than their staff can afford to live on. Um, uh, and I think that you know, it's it's m- the biggest the, the people that are going to be hit most by it are not small businesses, mm-hmm. but big businesses okay. who are profiting off the back of putting their their workers into poverty. Yeah, definitely. So, do you not think that the minimum wage at the moment you could live off that? I, I don't think so. No. Uh, okay. No. Um, you know what the no and and the the science backs that up. You know the the government so called living wage, mm-hmm. uh, which is only available to over twenty fives because apparently people under the age of twenty five don't need to yeah. earn enough to live on, um, uh, which is which is utterly ridiculous and, and uh, contemptible. Um, the um, but the living wage foundation calculate the the actual living wage. Uh, and, and the government's so-called living wage falls well below that. Okay. Okay. So moving on to something slightly different. Uh, so would you like to ask yeah. a question? Uh, um, so on behalf of Labour, uh, how would you begin to address the poverty gap? Um, well, uh, so I think good wages is a good start. Of course. Um, and uh, getting rid of some of the most uh, pernicious and, and disgusting uh, benefit uh, cuts that, that went on under the... Uh, under the last few years of Tory government and before that under the Tories and the Liberals in coalition, things like the bedroom tax. Um, but those are those are short-term measures, I think. What you need to do is you need to break the cycle of intergenerational poverty and inequality. Uh, and that means properly investing in schools in areas like Twerton, making sure that children in Twerton are just as likely to go off to university as children in Lansdowne or Bathwick. You know, Bath has the... Bath is the most unequal constituency in the country for university entry. I did some analysis on this and found that you know, we've got a gap of, of over 80%, I think, between uh, Lansdowne and Bathwick and, and the wealthy areas of Bath and, and Twerton, where, where only about 12% uh, of, of young people go off to university. That's not good enough. and you know, That's, a, that's a, yeah. uh, something that comes about as a result of capitalism, <laughs> I, I think, fundamentally. Um, uh, so in recent years, the Bath Council has invested money into building affordable housing uh, estates to give young people the opportunity to get on the property ladder. However, many have complained that the affordable housing is well above the national average. For instance, the Spring Wharf housing estate, which also dubs itself as having affordable homes, uh, and 300 homes planned for construction are at the top of or down uh, on a greenbelt land of all things. My question is, what would Labour do to solve these issues? Uh, well, so... Um uh, Jeremy Corbyn the other day uh, launched a, uh, a policy paper called Housing for the Many, Not the Few. Uh, and it's about, um, I think we need to redefine affordable because 80% of market value is not affordable for, for most people. We need a massive house building program. Yeah. And that means building council houses uh, at, at social rent, uh-huh. um, not not just um, luxury houses with, with then a few that are sold at 80% of market yeah, rent. You know, because that's... That's not accessible to the vast majority of people. That's not accessible to me or any other young person. Uh, that's accessible still just to fairly wealthy people. Uh, we need to be building council houses so people are, are renting at, at a properly affordable uh, rent. Yeah. Um, uh, and, and I'd like to see us eventually go back to the days where you know, when council estates and council housing was first built and, and you had that massive housing boom after the Second World War. We want to go back to a situation where, where you know, these these estates are not are not just uh, kind of areas just for people who are uh, you know, on social security or on low incomes. Uh, they should be vibrant communities for everyone. You know? yeah. We shouldn't see social housing, council housing, as as just something for the very poorest. You know, it should be a, a an integrated community of people. But but when you start to lose all that social housing and and you've got more people who are really struggling, then obviously you have to prioritise it for them. We should have much more council housing so that it, those are areas where everyone can live and then have an affordable, properly affordable yeah. rent. Yeah, okay. Uh, so I'm sure that you agree that the homeless like, epidemic, maybe even, uh, in Bath is awful. And, it's that, and I understand that it's very difficult to have the necessary funding uh, to solve or at least improve the issue. However, what do you think is the best course of action? Well, um... Uh, 
something that, that has been done in other countries uh, and I think is being piloted here finally, something called Housing First, uh, which is where you've got people who are uh, rough sleeping or, or otherwise homeless. And, and you, know, you need to remember that homelessness is not just people that you see on the streets. Uh, yeah. That is the tip of the iceberg when it comes to homelessness. There's people sofa surfing, especially young people just um, you know, sleeping on, on friend sofas and, and moving around yeah. uh, between friends and family. And you've got people living in temporary accommodation as well. Uh, and then on top of that, you've got all the people who are really precarious in their housing and you know who are uh, living paycheck to paycheck and, and potentially could be homeless the next month. Uh, or even if they've got the money, potentially because their landlord can evict them for no reason. Mm -hmm, sure. Um, so obviously we need to do things to, to stem the flow. Uh, so you know, make tenants more secure, uh, reform uh, uh, the ways that, that landlords can evict people, and, and you know you should be protected from eviction uh, as a tenant. But but then also with with people who are homeless, um, especially rough sleepers, a lot of whom, a lot of whom, but not all of whom, will have other issues on top of the fact that they are uh, sleeping rough. So mental health problems, drug or alcohol misuse, uh, domestic violence, um, a lot of things that that you're not going to solve while you're living on the streets. You know, if you're trying to overcome a mental health problem, you know, sleeping every night in a shop doorway is not the best way to overcome that mental Definitely, health problem. Yeah. You need to get into housing first. And, and that's, that's what housing first is. You, you give someone the housing and then that helps them uh, get, uh, you know, recover from their other problems okay. that, that potentially cause that homelessness. Yeah. yeah. Now you wanted to... <coughs> so uh, the, Labour part, the Labour Party stated um, if they were in office, they'd aim to abolish university tuition fees. Um, where do you plan to get the necessary funding to do this? Um, so, uh, I'm trying to remember back, you know, we had a fully costed manifesto and I think that it was primarily from, uh, uh, from an increase in corporation tax, or in fact, n I don't think even uh, an increase in it uh, particularly. I think it was uh, reversing some of the cuts to corporation tax that have happened quite, quite recently. Um, or even just reversing the planned cuts to corporation tax. But free education uh, is often talked about in terms of, you know, so that students don't have debt and, uh, you know, preventing the barriers to university. And that's all really important. Yeah. Um, but but it's, it's much more fundamental than that. You know, free education is about stopping education from being a commodity that is bought and sold, uh, stopping universities from acting like businesses, because at the moment, universities have been forced by, by the conditions that they're operating in to act like businesses. And so you end up with chief executives of universities, like Linus Brakewell at the University of Bath, being paid, uh, coming, on to a quarter of a uh, coming on to a half a million pounds yeah. a year. Uh, you get universities expanding at the rate that they have so that they can maximise their revenue and become more sustainable. Uh, and so you get loads more students in Bath and, and, you know, in an unsustainable way where, where housing... Uh, is affected as a result of that. Yeah. Um, you know, those kind of things uh, will be solved with uh, you know, properly free education, um, where where we we once again, you know, consider education as something that is good for society, not just for the individual. Um, and and people will ask, you know, why should the big businesses pay for it? Uh, and it's because you know businesses profit from university education. You know, someone like Richard Branson didn't go to university, so he's not, you know, someone could say, you, know, you could write, you know, fairly say, not rightly, but fairly you know, make an argument that Richard Branson should not be paying for someone to go to university. He hasn't benefited from it. But you know, I say he has benefited from it because I hope that you know, Virgin Trains and Virgin Planes have been designed by people with engineering degrees. Yeah. Um, you know, he's profited from the UK higher education system, and therefore he should be putting back into it. Uh, yeah, and that, so that's why we fund it through, through corporation tax, because uh, they're benefiting from universities. So I'm assuming you do personally believe <coughs> that university tuition should be free? Oh, fund yeah, yeah, absolutely. Definitely. Yeah. Okay. Uh, now, many voters admitted, to change the topic again, yeah. many voters admitted that they didn't understand the term tactical voting. Uh, now, during the last election, uh, do you think that tactical voting in Bath is a good idea, or should people vote for the party that they support? Uh, tactical voting is a terrible idea. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, so Bath Labour Party have done some polling recently. We got Servation, we commissioned Servation, uh, mm -hmm. who are a polling company. 
uh, you know, very legitimate polling company. They were the only ones to correctly predict the the result of the general election and the referendum. Um, if you, you know, if you want a laugh, uh, have a look on YouTube for for Damien Lyons Lowe, the chief exec of Servation, going on to the Daily <laughs> Politics about a week before the general election and saying, yeah, so we're predicting a hung parliament, and everyone laughing at him because it seemed so absurd. Uh, and, and he was vindicated, and now he's had the last laugh. Um, so we got them to do some do some polling uh, in Bath, um, and we found that about half of the Liberal Democrat voters in Bath are people who wanted to vote Labour, but felt they had to tactically vote. Uh, and if people just voted for what they wanted in Bath, we'd have a Labour MP. So all yeah. those people who want Labour are just throwing away their vote to, to the Liberals who brought us five years of... of Benefit cuts and uh, public service cuts yeah, to 100%. education and, and NHS and and it brought us nine thousand pound tuition fees uh, and it's not good enough. Uh, they're, they're not good enough. Yeah. Uh, and I think about it in the way that the Liberal Party, uh, in a different form, but but similar, existed when the Labour Party was formed. You know, back in nineteen hundred, you, know, you had the Tories and you had the Liberals. And back then, you know, we said. No, the Liberals aren't good enough. We can't just throw our support behind the Liberals. Yeah. We need a party of Labour um, to, to stand up for these you know, democratic socialist ideas, ideals. Um, and so when, when people who believe in, in those democratic socialist uh, ideas then go and give their vote to the Liberals uh, because they say, oh, they're better than the Tories, well, you know, if, we, if we thought like that in 1900, if Keir Hardy had thought like that back then, and the Labour Party never would have existed. We never would have got the NHS and the minimum wage and, and maternity pay and paternity leave and, and you know, all the things that we benefited from uh, through having Labour governments. Uh, yeah. So I say, no, Liberals aren't good enough. Yeah. <laughs> Vote Labour in Bath. And, and if everyone who wanted Labour voted Labour, we'd get Labour. Yeah, yeah. OK, now, do you want to... So what are the issues that you feel passionate about? What, what, what are some political so you personally uh, poverty and inequality you know, yeah yeah, yeah. Okay. it's uh, uh, you know and, and from that stems loads of other things yeah. you know like I've said about education being a cause of you know in unequal education being a cause of, of inequality later in life and, and then um, you know, from that and, and cycle. income inequality you then get health inequality where you know there's a 10-year life expectancy gap in birth where you know, if you live in one area of birth if you Born and grow up in one area of Bath, uh, compared to another area, you can live ten years, uh, ten years less. Which okay. is just unacceptable. So a few more local topics then. Yeah. What are your uh, opinions on the way Beach and Cliff dealt with the, the slave auction incident? Um, so I thought I thought long and hard about it actually mm -hmm. because yeah. Um, yeah, often you see these kinds of things and, and you uh, you have a snap reaction and I think it's really important not to. You have to. Think you know? Did the governors uh, have more information than than perhaps the public would? Uh, is it you know? Would it be right for for, for young people? You know, wh what are the circumstances in which you you potentially massively disrupt a young person's education and and by by ex permanently excluding them and 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 therefore the the difference that that makes uh, in later years? But you know, having thought about all of that, I, I can't see any justification for for not expelling the, the pupils that, that yeah, did it uh, because you have to have a zero tolerance policy to racism uh, you, you know that was just unreconstructed racism that, that, that um, I think anyone especially anyone at secondary school mm -hmm. knows is, is wrong uh, yeah. and knows is, is unacceptable uh, and would would know the the potential the most likely outcome of that would be that they would be permanently excluded, and and the damage that was done to that uh, that child who who had this done to them, it, yeah, I, I I see no justification for for them uh, over for the governors overturning the the head teacher's decision, mm -hmm. um, and I think those governors probably need to consider their positions on on that school governing board now. Yeah, yeah. So you've recently mentioned the admissions policy at Beach and Cliff. Uh, what are the main <coughs> problems with their policy? It's, um, it's really it's quite it's quite a complicated thing. So um, I'll tell you how I how I came across mm -hmm. it. Yeah. Was because lots of young people uh, or lots of lots of parents in uh, in the south of Bath in places like Oddown were were emailing me saying uh, you know, I didn't get my my kid didn't get into any of the schools that we picked. They're now being sent to St Mark's, which is 
the opposite side of Bath. And and Beach and Cliff kept coming up with people not getting in there. And I thought, hang on, but you're living quite close to Beach and Cliff. Um, yeah. How are they not getting in? Uh, and so I looked at their admissions policy, and then I did some mapping on uh, of, of the the last few years of uh, of their admissions because they tell you. So their admissions policy is that they they, they go through all the like siblings at school, you're in care, etc., things like that, and then you get down to just based on distance um, from the school. And and with with all the other schools in in Bath, they do it just based on straight line distance away from the school. Beach and Cliff, they have reserved 40% of the remaining places for children north the river, 40% south the river, and 20% outside Bath. And so I mapped that out north and south the river and found that basically if you live north of the river, you've got a much better chance of getting in. There's far fewer, um, far fewer children north the river. So what that means is that north the river, where, where on average um, house prices are, are 10% higher and people are wealthier, um, you've got uh, about 50% bit better chance of, of your kid getting in, which is just not right, especially because the school is south of the river. Sure. Um, and, and what that does is it means that you've got a very, very narrow radius south of the river where uh, children can get in, and a very wide one north of the river. Um, and, and that just didn't seem fair to me. And, and I put that onto a map of uh, child poverty in Bath and found that you've got this big um, area of child poverty around the southwest of Bath, and um, uh, and, and they're always excluded. Uh, okay. Yeah, but, yeah. Uh, but if you just had a straight line distance, then, then a lot of the time they would be included. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And, um, so that was um, quite technical. As a request yeah. from the students at our school, um, what are your ideas to reverse the mental health crisis? And, and uh, do, you, do you feel that the, government, the current government's avoided the issue? Um, so, you know, there, I think there's there's a tendency with uh, you know uh, people on, on the right who've who've now you know, the Tories and to an extent the Liberals who've um, you know they've seen that people care about mental health. Uh, and seen that there's a bit of a, that there is a crisis in mental health, and, and so what they've done is they've they've started talking about mental health a lot, which is good. And you know, breaking stigma I is good, and getting people to talk is is good. But you know, once you've got people to talk and, and open up about mental health problems and, and identify that you know they uh, they've got a mental health problem, and, and there then needs to be money available for um, yeah. for for you know, mental health care. Uh, and that has been cut. That was that was cut by the coalition, cut by the Tories, and you know, we've now got I think five thousand fewer mental health nurses. I uh, do check that number. It might not be right. I'm plucking that out of the depths <laughs> of my memory, but um, you know, and and so when they talk about mental health, you know, it is all words and, and no action. Um, you know, they talk about parity between physical and mental health, uh, but but we don't see that at all. You know, um, you know we see. Um, physical health uh, in the NHS being cut, and then mental health being cut more. Um, you know, I don't want both to be cut the same. I want both to go up uh, yeah. in terms of funding. But um, yeah, so so I think just need we need better investment in mental health within within the NHS. Okay, and I think Chloe from our Year 13 journalism class. <coughs> yeah. I have a few questions um, relating back to homeless risk again and you know, things like that. I, I was wondering. We spend so much money on the wrong sorts of things in in relation to that. I mean, there's parts of the country that are spending money in order to put like metal um, poles on benches, and so you know, you know, homeless people couldn't be sleeping there. Yeah, defensive but architecture. Yeah, and yeah. With, I feel like we're spending more money on the on things which promote homelessness rather than help it. Um, yeah, no, uh, defensive architecture is is uh, disgusting. You know, the um, this kind of thing, and, and you know, I spoke out when when we saw big boards going up in front of uh, in front of empty shop doorways in Bath that were painted nicely, but to yeah. stop, uh, and and it was admitted I think at the time to it was to stop homeless people from from having that that you know very rudimentary and, and inadequate but some level of shelter um, from from the elements, um, you know, and I think you know we've seen that that people just do not appreciate defensive architecture. We've seen um, where it goes up, where you've got spikes uh, on the ground, people going along with um, 
you've seen people going along with, with buckets of concrete uh, overnight and, and covering them up uh, and uh, making them redundant, which is brilliant, you know. And uh, it's yeah. all well tax and put, you know, all the money that's going towards a royal wedding and things like that, and yet they're finding <coughs> homeless people who, you know, who would be get off the streets, mm -hmm. you know, near the royal wedding. I mean, yeah, that was disgusting yeah, as well. The, I mean, the Tory leader of um, Windsor yeah, Borough Council. Yeah, charity and things. I find it appalling that, you know, they're finding them up to £100 and things like that. Yeah, and I think we know, you know that doesn't work. Um, find, I mean, finding like, someone like a, who... But by doing so, don't you think good. that encourages them to go and find a homeless shelter, maybe? N no, I, I don't think so. Um, because, you know, homeless shelters um, are often at capacity. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, we don't want to... We don't want to see homeless shelters, really. We want to see people in houses. Houses, um, yeah. You know, when, when someone is sleeping on the street, um, uh, and I've talked already about the, the plethora of other issues that could uh, could have caused someone's homelessness, you know, they need to be uh, treated uh, for any uh, any other issues that, that are going on and, and given stable housing, not just a, not a room in a hostel, and you know, that's not to say that the hostels are bad. You know, Julian House and, and other charities yep. doing similar things are brilliant um, uh, in what they do, but, but they shouldn't be necessary. You know, people should be in stable, permanent accommodation. And it is, yep. it's really hard to find that exactly that stable and permanent accommodation. Everywhere you look, pretty much is like there's a shared home or there's a home you can only like live in for a certain amount of weeks or months or something, and that's. It costs nearly as much as the house, owning yeah. the house, and um, you see all these homeless people around, and I can understand <laughs> how someone can get <laughs> like that. Yeah. So but surely Julian House is a better alternative than than them being on the streets. Yeah, sleeping no, of, co of course it is. Yeah. But, but finding someone because they're sleeping on the streets to, to encourage them to get mm -hmm. into a hostel isn't the right thing to do. Um, you know, we shouldn't be uh, punishing people for, for sleeping. No, on maybe the not streets. finding them. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And um, you got any more questions? Okay. Well, I think that about wraps it up for today. Thank you very much for joining us. It's been an absolute pleasure to meet you. Um, I've been Matt Benson, and we'll see you next time with MP Jacob rees -Mogg. Thank you very much. <laughs> Cheers. Cheers.